more intelligent. And those intelligent fathers of the faith, we've got a line, 2,000 years, of very intelligent people that didn't buy into this lie that things have to be logical first. Now, if you get into this imaginative stuff and, and, and you don't use logic and you don't use intelligence and you don't smart, like I feel like today, one of the things that we need in the church, like I just read Pope Benedict has a new book out that I recommend to you. It's a very hard read. You will have to drink coffee to get through it. <laughs> but it is the best book on Jesus I have ever read. It's called Jesus of Nazareth. He, he, is the, he was the theologian for JP2. JP2 is more of a philosopher. He was the theologian. What I'm realizing is if we, if we lift our vision higher, we'll see that there are great teachers in the body right now on the earth that are trying to redirect the church. And many of us, like I'm not, I'm a poet, a songwriter, a worshiper, and I like to share my heart. And I'm a student of history and a student of theology. Even though I have my MDiv, I would never say I'm a teacher. What I am is a conduit for the synthesis of a lot of things that I learn from real teachers. And we got to lift our vision higher because there's a lot of people that are taking on authority that really hasn't been given to them. There's this, they're saying, I'm a teacher. Oh, really? (laughs) You're a teacher. Teachers in the body, a guy like Benedict, a guy like N.T. Wright right now, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a guy like Stanley Hueras, um, there's a, many teachers. Teachers are not necessarily, they sometimes are, but they're not necessarily fun to listen to. And they will not necessarily entertain you. You have to drink coffee to listen to them. You get my point? But they're trying to broaden us to understand. They don't just say, well, this, let me just deduce this all for you. They broaden us to understand what Jesus really called us to. And I think it's important today that we broaden ourselves beyond just kind of our little group of thinking. And realize that there are real teachers that we need to start submitting our understanding to. So what do we do? We utilize our imagination and have fun. And then we allow these teachers to then, we subject our dream, our vision, our understanding, our ideas to teachers and leaders and fathers. And so teachers see, uh, no matter what, the greatest, you know, people today are very, sometimes they're real smart. You know, I learned this in seminary. Gosh, you'd get a guy that was talking on, on uh, the end times. And I remember this in seminary, what they do is, okay, today we're going to have somebody in, and they're going to teach you all about pre-trip. Okay, all right. So we get in there, and they'd start teaching. And they'd use all these huge words and they'd spin our heads like we were. And if you asked a question and it was somehow opposed to their view, they'd use such big words that everybody would just assume it was right even if it wasn't right. Okay. And then they'd bring somebody else in and they'd give their opinion on, you know, post-trib. And then somebody else would come in. I'm just picking on one thing. And then they'd come in and... They'd be amillennial or something. You know what I mean? And every single one of them could convince us with their big words. And if we're not careful, you know, that's what... What I started learning is they weren't really that good at teachers. Because the great teachers, see, they're so... This is their gift. They don't take one point of view. They take them all and synthesize it so all of us younger ones and people without the gifting aren't getting this deduction. It's like this. They're not saying, well, I'm going to teach you this and then I'm going to be so smart that you're not even going to understand it. No, the great teachers 
They do all of this, and they tell you all about all these different things, and then they create synthesis in the body from all of these different groups. And they say, and they, and they're so smart at it, they're able to actually not create division, but create union among all of these different ways of thinking, and show us the presence of the Lord in all of them. And then they bring it all home. And so we have to be careful of this. We've got a lot of people that have giftings, and they're talented, and they're gifted at a certain area, like maybe I am with a songwriting. And they're able to coerce a lot of people into understanding of things, but they're not submitted to authority of real teachers. Right? Like we heard yesterday, we have a lot of prophets that are calling themselves teachers. And so, um, anyway, but when we do that submission, this is kind of a simple, when we do that, we start to see that the greatest teachers and the greatest fathers for centuries have always opened us up as a people, as Christians, to the imagination. This isn't a new thing. I'm standing today on a firm foundation of centuries of fathers. You know, when the early ancients would pray, you know what they prayed? We have beheld the resurrection. These weren't people that were praying that were the apostles and saw Jesus and saw the resurrection. These were people that were 100, 200, 300 years post-resurrection. And they anticipated daily that they would see the resurrection. When I sing that in that song about the cross, the cross is always ready, every day it calls to me. There are witnesses of resurrection calling everyone. It's because I believe it. I believe that there are people that have already passed through this experience over and over and over again. Like in an eternal scope, there's people that have passed through that whole process of Paul in that Philippians passage through the suffering and they're already on to resurrection. And I believe Weekly and monthly, each one of us walks through those processes, whether we like it or not. We walk through sharing and suffering and experiencing that, and then we're on to resurrection. We are beholding the resurrection. We're beholding it. So when when they would pray that, it was the real deal. It wasn't, we should believe in the resurrection. No, we have seen it. We've seen it, right? We've seen it. Have you seen the resurrection at work in your life in the last month? It doesn't take long to see the work of resurrection in your life. How many times have you laid down an argument for the sake of a relationship? And you have laid down an argument in arguing for the sake of relationship. And maybe even in the moment, you look like the guy that lost. You look like the loser. And in the middle of all that... Jesus lights a candle for you, loser, because he's given you hope and future. And he's actually given not only you hope and future because you were willing to lay down. He's given that relationship hope and future. He's even given that other person hope and future because you were willing to be the loser. 